I used to hate the word coping. And it's hard to hate that word when you're dealing with mental health issues because it seems half the treatment is based on it. To me, coping was a word devoid of joy. It signified great discomfort and distress. It reminded me of how so much of my time was spent just trying to survive, fending off uncomfortable feelings. Avoidance was much more my thing. Almost as bad was the term coping strategy. How was trying to fool myself into a false sense of calm going to solve my problems, I thought? How was breathing going to make the challenge any easier? Would it make it go away? Would it make it any less real? Every time I heard the term coping strategy, it felt like an affront to all my suffering. Until last night. I was lying in bed awake at 4 a.m., tossing and turning. I was getting ready to post this podcast for the first time, and I was so worried about the responses, doubting my decision to put myself out there, afraid I'd be hurt, rejected again, like when I was a kid in school wanting to be accepted, but instead being mocked and shunned. My thoughts were racing almost as quickly as my heart. My chest felt tight. The thought of experiencing that kind of heartbreak again made me slightly nauseous. The feeling was so upsetting and so uncomfortable that I could barely stand it. Why would I put myself through this, I thought. Maybe I shouldn't do it. But I really wanted to do this, I reminded myself. I took a deep breath and tried to calm down. And then it clicked. This was coping. Hi, you're listening to Before the Dawn. I'm Liron Cohen, and this is my podcast about my journey to mental health. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Before the Dawn. And this is actually kind of a therapeutic post for me, because uh, when I say I used to hate um, the term coping, I, I literally do mean last night. <laughs> so it's just a few hours ago. Um, and uh, literally, I hated so much that my therapist actually started using synonyms, because, you know, a lot of therapy is about coping. Um, and when you can't use the word coping, because it evokes such resentment in your patient, it, it can be a little hard. And I know that this is actually one of the first episodes that I'm doing. And so it's kind of maybe funny to talk about coping when I haven't actually talked enough about what I'm coping with. But it's not really when you think about it, because the base of all coping, the way that I see it now in my kind of epiphany from last night, is the ability to tolerate feeling. So anything can be a sensation that is uncomfortable, that is too hard to bear, a broken heart, um, overwhelming anxiety, my image in the mirror, um, my worry about whether people will like this podcast, as I mentioned. So we're all experiencing these feelings all the time. It's not exclusive to people who are dealing with mental health. Um, ideally, we were taught coping skills when we were little and not, I mean, you know, it's not something you go to kindergarten and, you know, are taught coping skills. But in that first connection with your caretaker, when you scream because you're wet or you're hungry or you're, you have a stomach ache and your mother sues you and she rocks you a little bit and she maybe sings you a song and, you know, the touch of her skin on yours and so you learn to associate those things with soothing, and hopefully you'll take that with you in your later years when you start to soothe yourself. So you'll probably, you know, maybe you'll put some a song that you like, or maybe you'll do something physically to kind of calm you down. Um, and of course, that's just a very basic coping mechanism. We we see all around us people using different coping strategies, and oftentimes we learn from mirroring them. There are models, especially when we're kids. That's when we learn a lot of them. 
But, you know, when something goes wrong along the way, when we mirror um, coping mechanisms that are not healthy, or when we haven't learned enough good coping mechanisms that we start, our brain starts to look for solutions and starts coming up with all these different ways to do it that are unhealthy, oftentimes inefficient, and... um, you know, at best, they're maybe just right un- inefficient. They don't soothe you. At worst, they are actually harmful. Oftentimes, they're self-destructive. For example, eating disorders is uh, um, a strategy, a coping mechanism that I, my brain, invented for myself in order to, in order to try to bear experiences that were too hard for me. And I actually, I'm going to talk about it in a future podcast episode. And addictions are another uh, very self-destructive um, coping mechanism that people develop sometimes. There are many ways, again, that, that we, because we do have to cope all the time uh, with big things and with little things. Again, when, just like with health, when coping is done right, you barely even notice you're doing it, right? Because we do it all the time. But when we are dealing with mental health issues, it is true, there is a lot of coping. There's a lot of coping that has to be done. I, I, always, I always kind of protest to my therapist that I feel that for me, because I'm constantly laden with anxiety, um, that a lot, of my, a lot of the time I do spend on coping because even when I do things that are supposed to be enjoyable, oftentimes I experience a lot of distress around those things. So uh, I do a lot of coping and I feel that it takes away a lot of the joy. But I now understand that really coping is about being able to feel those uncomfortable feelings and stay in those feelings and not run away from them. And it kind of is a process of desensitization. So when you're constantly avoiding those feelings, the slightest reminder of that feeling is already enough to evoke such panic, right? But if you're slowly desensitizing yourself to those feelings, then you can bear them more. And those what coping strategies are about. There are different ways to alleviate our suffering because also, as pointed out to me, when we are in that place of extreme discomfort, we're not we're not in the best place to make decisions. We're not in the best way to deal with life's challenges. Um, our physical and mental and emotional states are not really ideal to coming up with good solutions because we're so much stuck on the the solution that's inefficient. So to me, I, I never I, I always think of myself as somebody who doesn't know how to cope, somebody who wouldn't be able to handle life's challenges. And I think that that is rooted in my like two two of my unfortunately base beliefs, which I'm actively working on changing. Uh, which are that the world is unsafe and that I am helpless. And again, there will be many podcast episodes in the future where we can talk about, and we will talk about where those beliefs came from and uh, what preserved them and how I can actively try to challenge them. But those nevertheless are two uh, basic assumptions that I have had for the majority of my life coming, you know, starting in my, in my childhood. And so I, in advance, think I will not be able to cope. I will not be able to hold this feeling. I will not be able to find a good solution. And, you know, when I have to, I can come up with some pretty good solutions. So it's mostly about my thoughts. My thoughts and my beliefs are the things that trigger my feelings. And so if I feel the world is unsafe and I'm helpless, then of course I will feel the stress. And there are many other things that can cause distress. There's an endless source of discomfort and um, anxiety provoking um, content in this world. So coping strategies are the way that we can alleviate some of the suffering while we're in this feeling that is so uncomfortable for us. So we can learn to soothe ourselves so that we're better positioned to come up with better solutions and to deal with what it is that we're dealing with. So the thoughts come first and then the feelings. The thoughts we will talk about in a different episode because that is another thing that we can train ourselves to um, question, challenge, change, okay? But now we're in the feeling, okay? The feeling has already happened. So I'm actually going to share with you 
um, what I call my toolbox, and it's not my term. Uh, but, you know, I used to think about it when you say, oh, you know, here are some tools that you can use. And I used to think it's such a theoretic psychobabble that means nothing. But I understand that now because I actually have collected several tools and they are real physical palpable things that I can use. And and palpable actually is key because when we get stuck in our head and in our in this very uncomfortable feeling, be it because we are projecting into the future and feeling anxiety and worry, or because we're thrown into the past because a trauma, a past trauma has been triggered and uh, we're feeling flooded by past experiences, or because of any other kind of limiting thought that is causing us distress, we are in our heads. We are in our heads, we are overwhelmed with these feelings, and we need to ground ourselves. So first of all, I try to employ all the senses. So for me, the number one thing that is the most important thing in calming me down is music. First of all, music is processed differently in the brain. So I think already it kind of takes us from a place of thought, rigid thinking, and it employs other areas in the brain. So I think that already kind of shifts the way that we're thinking. Secondly, music is very much a a very trusted feeling provoker. So I know that there are certain songs or certain pieces of music that remind me of certain sensations, certain experiences, certain smells, tastes. In me, it evokes a lot of memories and a lot of feelings. And so I made a playlist. I called it SSRI <laughs> for you for you who uh, know uh, medications for um, anxiety and, and depression. SSRI is a group of medications that is meant to boost serotonin in the in the brain. And uh, serotonin is uh, the, the little happiness uh, creator in our brain. So I made a playlist that is made out of not necessarily music that's calming, although that might be what will work for you. For me, I find that because I love to sing and when I hear music, I immediately want to sing along. Um, and actually, it's good, it's good in, in moments of distress for me to sing because it helps regulate um, breathing, which is very important when you're in a situation wherein you're in your distress or in my case, also when you're in a panic attack. Um, so... I use music that uh, some of the songs are songs that I can sing to and they're really belty so that I engage my whole body and my diaphragm and I can really kind of get into the breathing or songs that are very up tempo and I can dance to because that kind of activates my body and kind of shakes it out which is also really good but what's important also is to use music that you know reliably is going to trigger the kind of feelings that you want to be feeling right so in my case it doesn't all have to be happy. Some of it can be very moving and soulful, but I, I wouldn't want to use a song that will take me back to a really bad time in my life and will, you know, bring back all those unhappy feelings, right? Because that's not what this playlist is about. I can listen to that at another time when I feel strong and I want to, you know, wallow in something. But so this is my playlist. Um, and um, you can make your own playlist based on what helps you. And sometimes it's trial and error. Um, then I also try to employ my sense of smell. So because I noticed one day I was feeling very, very upset and I went out into the garden to try to get some fresh air and there was a flower that was in bloom that reminded me of a very, very sweet time in my childhood. And so I breathed it in and it made me feel so good. And so I then found a cream that was not exactly the same smell, but it also re represented a smell that I really liked that kind of took me back to a, a very sweet, soft place inside myself. And so I also sometimes will put it on myself and just breathe it in. And again, the act of breathing the smell, because I want to really breathe in the smell, then it also helps to regulate the breathing. Um touch. Uh, my wife collects rocks. We have rocks all over the house. And so she gave me this very soft rock. And I know it's kind of funny to think about it. But yes, if you touch different rocks, some of them are softer than the others. And uh, it's also it stays very cool. And um, I put it in my hand and I kind of 
um, just kind of caress it and move it from side to side, from hand to hand. And that also helps me um, feel in my body again, which is very helpful. So I'm, I'm, I kind of try to employ the different senses. Um, again, breathing is grounding. So you don't even have, I mean, there are different exercises online um, for breathing, you know, different counting and stuff like that. But to me, even just kind of going back into focusing on the breathing. And um, I know I, I used to hate when people said breathe and think, but it actually works. It's actually important. It, it is grounding. It's like the most, it's the most fundamental thing that we do as humans is breathe. Um, and the rhythm of the breathing is very important. And, you know, they say to breathe into your belly. Now, of course, that's not anatomically correct. We're not, our, we're breathing into our lungs and not into our belly. But it basically, when you're trying to breathe into your belly, it just means that you're engaging your lungs in a way that expands your diaphragm and pushes on the belly. And it's, it's a more soothing way to breathe deeply and not in a shallow way. Um, and it also... Uh, from what I've read, I'm not an expert, but from what I've, I've read, it also helps regulating the vagus nerve, which um, is at the kind of around the diaphragm area, and it also is very much involved in our nervous system and our and its response. Um, cognitively, since I'm trying to not get engaged in the bad thoughts that are causing my feelings to be all distressed. Um, I try to list at least three or five things that I'm grateful for. It can be the smallest or the biggest things. It can be I'm grateful for my cats or I'm grateful that um, I was able to find fresh cucumbers in the store yesterday because last time they were not fresh and I love cucumbers. So <laughs> things like that. It can be small or big. I'm grateful that I have running water in my house and that I have a roof over my head. You know, it can be anything, small, big. Um, it just puts my my thoughts back into a place of recognizing the good and not just focusing on the bad. And again, I know that this sounds like psychobabble, but it really does work. At least it's been working for me when I finally um, was willing to try it. And when I, you know, I, I'm the kind of person who has to be convinced. I'm not just like, oh, okay, I'll just do these things. I'll say these affirmations. I, I have to be convinced. I have to truly... Um, want to do something. However, I have learned that sometimes you can't be convinced first. You have to try it first, and then you see that it works, and then you're convinced. So in this case, this is what happened. Uh, I had to just do what I was told, do what I was, you know, taught to do uh, several times, not just after one time, but, you know, for for my body and my brain to really kind of understand this. Um, finally, and this is more of like from the spiritual perspective, but it's very important to me anyway. One of the best ways to come out of, to get out of your head is to get into action. And in my experience, I found that doing something that is part of my purpose was what I needed. So purpose is really important. And in fact, I just recently heard something really beautiful in the context of eating disorders, you need to you need to find purpose because you're not just recovering from something, you have to be recovering to something. And purpose is that thing that when we are in it, we feel worthy. It helps to make us feel that there is meaning to our lives, that there is meaning to our existence, and it kind of removes us from the small things and uh, opens us up to the big picture. And so finding something that makes you feel that you have meaning in your life. And I think for many people, I know for me, a lot of the time that is that has something to do with helping others. Oftentimes helping others is the easiest way to get out of your head and feel that there is more meaning in the world and in your life. So find something that gives you a sense of purpose. It can be the smallest or the biggest. For me, this podcast is is exactly that. <laughs> it was born, it was a thought that I've been having for a long time, but getting into action and doing it, that was uh, part of my toolbox. I know that when I do this, I feel good. Now, I'm coping with releasing it to the world, sharing it with others, knowing that I'm going to be putting myself out there, which is scary for me. And so that is the coping 
So it's kind of, it's, it's, it goes back and forth. I was in my purpose in order to cope better. And now I have to cope with being in my purpose. So it's a very interesting cycle. But you know what it's called? I guess life. So that's what I have for you today. Again, there's always more to say, and that's why we have more episodes coming. If you like this podcast, uh, I hope you'll hit the subscribe button and um, also maybe leave a review. And remember, sharing is caring. You never know who might be struggling alone. So please consider sharing this podcast with your friends and on your social media, because you never know who might benefit from hearing this now. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Before the Dawn. Feel free to email me anytime at beforethedawnjourney at gmail.com. Please remember, this is my story and my story alone. I am not a doctor or a therapist or an expert. I am just a person who wants to shed light on subject matters that are all too often kept in the dark.